Hi, Maltes from 10 Minute Physics here. Welcome to tutorial number four. This time I'm going to show you how to write a pinball simulator. For this I will show you how to handle the collision between a ball and a capsule shape, a ball and an arbitrary boundary, and how to handle user input. This tutorial builds on tutorial number three, so I highly recommend to watch tutorial number three first. Before we can start to code, we have to look at the math first. There is an important vector operation we need for our project. It's finding the point on the line AB, which is closest to a point P. The closest point C is the projection of P onto the line AB. Now the question is, how can we compute it? Since it lies on the line AB, we can express it with a regular number T in this way. If T is zero, we are at point A. If it is one, we are at A plus B minus A, which is B. For values in between, we are somewhere on the line. Therefore, all we need is to find t. In the previous tutorial, we saw how to compute projections onto a line. For this, we need the normal vector n. It is the vector that points along AB and has unit length. Now using the dot product, we can compute the distance from A to C by measuring the distance from A to P along n. We can also compute the distance from A to B in this way. We get t by dividing these two numbers. If p is above a with respect to n, then the numerator is zero and t is zero as well. In this case, we get a as the result. If p is above b with respect to n, then the two distances are the same and we get one for t landing at point b. We do not even have to make n unit length because it appears both in the numerator and in the denominator. So we can simply use B minus A. It can happen that the projection of P does not lie between A and B. Then T is smaller than zero or larger than one. In this case, we want the end point to be the closest point. It is easy to achieve this by clamping T to the interval zero to one. We can now use this operation to handle the collision between a ball and a capsule shape. A capsule shape is defined by a segment AB and the radius R. We are going to model the flipper with this shape. In order to handle the collision, we first compute the closest point C on the axis of the capsule. Then we replace the capsule by a ball centered at C with radius R and handle the collision between the two balls as in the last tutorial. This works nicely even at the rounded ends. We will rotate the flipper about A in our simulation. For this, we need the concept of angular velocity. This is a simple number called omega. It tells us how fast something rotates with a unit angle per second. In the simulation, we will give the flipper a fixed angular velocity. At every time step, we can then multiply omega with the time step size to compute an angle by which we need to rotate the capsule about A. A last concept we need is the perp operator to compute a vector that is perpendicular to a given vector v with coordinates x and y. The result is a vector that is turned by 90 degrees in the mathematically positive direction, which is counterclockwise. As you can see from the diagram, it can easily be computed. It is the vector with coordinates minus y and x. To handle the collision between the ball and the capsule, we also need the velocity at the contact point. For the ball, this is simply the velocity of the ball itself. For the capsule, this is not the case. In this case, we can compute the velocity vector using the angle velocity omega and the vector r pointing from the rotation center to the contact point. The velocity is then simply r scaled by omega and turned 90 degrees. Finally, we need to be able to handle the collision of the ball with the boundary. We will represent the boundary as a closed loop of straight segments. To handle the collision, we first search for the segment that is closest to the ball. Then we replace the ball by a point and the segment by a capsule with the radius of the ball and handle the collision between the two. This yields the correct behavior at sharp corners. There is one last problem we have to fix. If the center of the ball gets on the wrong side of the boundary segment, it gets pushed in the wrong direction. The situation is rare and only happens with large time steps or high velocities. In this case, we compute what is called an inward normal. We turn the segment AB by 90 degrees. For this, we need to make sure that we define the boundary counterclockwise. We then check 
whether our direction vector points in the opposite direction. This can be done using the dot product. In such a case, we flip the correction. Now we are ready to look into the code. We use the HTML skeleton from the 2D simulations that I described in the first tutorial. By the way, it took me quite a long time to figure out how to make pages look good on mobile devices. By default they look like on the desktop scaled down and are hardly readable. This is simply done by this magical meta statement. Inside the HTML document we have the head section. Here we define the title that shows in the tab of the browser. Next in the style section we define styles for the body and buttons. Inside the body section we define the content of the page. We define a button to restart the scene. Next we have the text score and the text element with the content zero. We assign an ID to it so that we can access it and modify it later. Below them we have the canvas to draw the pinball machine. The script section contains all the Java code. I already described the drawing setup in the first tutorial. Here we set the size of the canvas. We also define functions to map physical coordinates to canvas coordinates. We reuse the vector2 class we wrote in the last tutorial with its function set, clone, add, add vectors, subtract, subtract vectors, length and dot. However, we add a function perp to create a new vector that is 90 degrees rotated as described in the math section. We then write the function closest point on segment that returns the point on segment AB that is closest to P. First, we compute the vector AB pointing from A to B. Next, we compute T with the formula I described before. The equation has AB.AB in the denominator. If it is zero, we will divide by zero, which produces an error. However, AB.AB is only zero if the vector has zero length. This means A and B are in the same location. In this case, the closest point is A or B, and we return A. In the other case, computing T is safe. We return the vector A plus AB times T. Next we define the physics scene. We reuse the ball class from the last tutorial. It contains a radius, a mass, a restitution, position and velocity. In the simulate function we simply add gravity times dt to the velocity and velocity times dt to the position as before. We then declare an additional class, obstacle. For our simple pinball machine we only use disks. They have a position, a radius and a push velocity. This is used to push balls away when they collide. We don't need a simulation method because obstacles are static and do not move. The flipper class is a bit more involved. As mentioned before, we represent it by a capsule shape. Therefore, we store a radius, a position and a length. The position defines the location of the point A and is fixed. The length is the distance from the point A to the point B. We also specify a rest angle which defines the orientation of the flipper when it is not activated. The sign property defines direction in which the flipper rotates. We also specify the angular velocity. The changing properties are the current rotation, the current angular velocity and the touch identifier which specifies whether the flipper is activated. In the simulation method we rotate the flipper if necessary. First we store the current rotation. Then we check whether the flipper is activated. If so, we add dt times angular velocity to the current rotation, but make sure that the rotation does not exceed the maximum rotation. If it is not activated, we subtract dt times the angular velocity from the current rotation and this time make sure that the rotation stays above zero. The current angular velocity can then be computed as the current rotation minus the previous rotation divided by dt. Here we also need to consider the sign. The SELECT method is used to specify whether the flipper is activated depending on the location of a touch given by POS. We return TRUE if the position lies within the circle defined by the rotation center and the length of the flipper. The GETTIP function returns the location of the point B, which in contrast to A is not fixed but depends on the current rotation. With these classes we can now specify the physics scene. It contains a gravity, the time step size and a score. It also contains arrays for boundary segments, balls, obstacles and flippers. The function setup scene creates the scene. We define an offset of the machine to the canvas boundary. We also set the score to zero. The border is specified as a set of points. 
Each segment is then defined as the vector from one point to the next, wrapping around to form a closed shape. We create two balls to make the game a little bit more interesting, and simply because we can. We create four obstacles, specifying their position, radius and push velocities. Finally, we create the flippers with opposite signs. The draw procedure is a bit longer this time. We first define a function to draw a disc, because we need it multiple times below. First we clear the canvas, then we draw the border in black using a path. For the balls, we set the color to dark grey and call draw disc for all of them. Since our obstacles are discs as well, we do the same thing for them, this time using the color orange. Drawing the flippers is a little bit more tricky. Here we use the ability of the canvas to specify a transformation. We translate to the rotation center and rotate such that the capsule is aligned with the x-axis. Then we draw a rectangle of size length times radius. Next we draw a disc at the origin and one shifted by length along the x-axis. Then we reset the transformation. Now let's check how this looks in the browser. Looks pretty good. As you can see, I designed the machine to match cell phones rather than a desktop screen. There is no fancy graphics since we only care about physics. I'll let you do that. The next step is to write the collision handling functions. I copied the function for ball-ball collisions from the previous tutorial. Handling ball-obstacle collisions is simpler because obstacles don't move. First we compute a vector dir from the ball center to the obstacle center. The length d of this vector tells us how far they are apart. If the distance is bigger than the sum of the radii, we can simply return. If not, we normalize the vector dir. We then compute the penetration depth core as the sum of the radii minus the current distance. To push the ball out of the obstacle, we add dir times core to its position. To make sure that the obstacle pushes the ball away, we replace the component of the ball's velocity along the penetration direction by the push velocity of the obstacle. We also increase the score by 1. Handling ball flipper collisions is a bit more involved. To make things a little bit easier, we assume that the ball has no effect on the flipper and that the restitution of the ball is zero. This means that the ball gets the velocity of the flipper at the contact point. First, however, we have to resolve the collision by pushing them apart. First, we compute the point on the flipper's axis that is closest to the ball center. Now we can conceptually replace the flipper by a ball around the closest point. Therefore, we first compute the vector dir pointing from the ball center to the closest point. We compute its length d and return if it's longer than the sum of the radius of the ball plus the radius of the flipper. Next we normalize the vector dir and push the ball along by the penetration distance, which is the sum of the radii minus the current distance. To update the velocity of the ball, we first have to compute the velocity of the flipper at the contact point. The radius is a vector that points from the rotation center to the contact point. To get the contact velocity, we turn it by 90 degrees and scale it with the current angle of velocity of the flipper. The flipper can only modify the component of the ball's velocity along the penetration direction. Therefore, we compute the projection of both the ball's velocity as well as the contact velocity onto the collision direction dir. We then replace the ball's velocity by the contact velocity along the direction dir. Finally, we need to handle collisions of the balls against the border. First, we need to find the segment that is closest to the ball center. We do this by iterating through all border points. We then compute the closest point C and the distance from the ball center to C. We keep track of the current minimal distance in MinDist. If the distance is smaller than MinDist, we update MinDist. We also store the current closest point and the inward normal. Now we can push the ball out of the boundary if necessary. We check whether the penetration direction points in the same direction as the inward normal. If so, we push the ball away as usual. Otherwise, we push it in the opposite direction. Finally, we update the velocity of the ball. Again, collisions can only change the velocity components along the penetration direction. For the boundary, we take the restitution of the ball into consideration as well. We are now finally ready to write the simulation function. First, we iterate through all the flippers and call their simulation function. Then we iterate through all the balls and call their simulation functions as well. With a nested loop, we handle ball-ball collisions. Next, we hand all ball obstacle collisions, ball flipper collisions, and ball border collisions. In the update function, we add one line. It replaces the content of the score text element with the current score value. 
What is new in this tutorial is that we have to handle user interaction. For this, we add four listeners to the canvas. One for touch start, one for touch end, one for mouse down and one for mouse up. The onTouch start function is called when the user touches the screen or when the number of touches increases. Because multiple touches can occur, the event variable passed to the callback contains a list of touches. For each touch, we transform its screen coordinates to the physical coordinates. Then we iterate through all the flippers and check whether they accept it. Since each touch has a unique identifier, we can use this to uniquely assign a touch to a flipper. Touch end is called when one of the touches is lost. Here we iterate through all the flippers and check whether the assigned touch is still in the event list. If not, we set the touch identifier of the flipper to minus one. To play on laptops or desktops, we also support mouse interaction. However, as you will see, playing the game with a mouse is really tricky because we do not have multiple touches. In the onMouseDown function, we first transform the click position into physical coordinates. For all flippers that accept the position, we set the touch identifier to zero because mouse events don't have identifiers. In the mouse up function, we simply set the touch identifiers of all flippers to minus one. So here is our pinball game in action. As you can see, it's really hard to play with the mouse. In the description, you find a link to a page that contains the HTML files of all tutorials. Okay, I hope you had fun watching this tutorial and I see you in the next one.